Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Elisa Smith. She is Director of Corporate Innovation Services at Centrifuge, a public-private partnership fostering innovation in Cincinnati. Elisa, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast. You and I connected uh, quite a little while ago, and we connected around this concept of innovation storytelling. So would you share with us your background and what brought you to the professional uh, moment that you're in today? Sure, and thank you so much, Katie, for inviting me to be here. I'm really excited about uh, being able to talk to you about innovation and storytelling. So um, my personal story of innovation began when I was growing up in a very small town and nothing ever changed. It was um, sometimes quite boring. (laughs) And I just had to... I guess, find ways to occupy myself. And I just, I did not like that at all. And that, <laughs> that led doesn't me... surprise me knowing <laughs> the, the dynamic and vibrant person that you are and all the energy you bring. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't just, surprise me. That would be kind of hard. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, I guess it was good because it helped me to know how I can, like what I can do to be creative and innovative. Yes. Um, when there's nothing else available to motivate me to do that. But um, because of that situation, I found myself experimenting quite a bit, whether it was um, experimenting with cooking or, um, you know, with making dirt pies <laughs> in the yard <laughs> or uh, taking photography of my dogs or whatever, arts and crafts. Um, that's where I started innovating and experimenting, I think, because of the boredom that I had. <laughs> I love that image. (laughs) Yeah, I think anyone listening who has ever made a mud pie, just raise your hand wherever you are. It can be a lot of fun, right? It's a foundational (laughs) moment in a childhood for creativity. It is. is. So yeah, we just had to use a lot of imagination growing up to occupy ourselves. And, And ultimately, that led you down a scientific pathway, right? Well, yeah, initially, I um, I really wanted to be a psychologist or to do something, you know, I loved English, I loved uh, psychology growing up. And I just, I think I wanted to do something more on the arts side. But um, I, I wasn't very engaged in the classes on that side. And I really needed something that would also stimulate my mind in a different way and give me more of a challenge. And so that's how I found uh, engineering. <laughs> So. Incredible. And I think a lot of people assume that if you're really creative or artistic, that you couldn't possibly be an engineer, that engineers think the exact opposite. But right. I know when you and I first met and talked about our backgrounds and our 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 kind of way of listening for story inside of science, um, I, I could tell right away that we were sort of kindred spirits because, <laughs> you know, you are so different than sort of that stereotype of what an engineer might look like, you know, yeah. in terms of mm-hmm. just in terms of the, the the amount of creativity and artistic background that you have. And uh, that's not just stereotype engineers. It's just a, it sort of is an existing social stereotype, I guess. Yeah. Well, the type of engineering I chose um, leaves room for that creativity. It's chemical engineering and it's multidisciplinary. So it really leaves room for exploring many different fields rather than just focusing on hardcore engineering, which is what I love about it. Yes. And and that led you into the innovation space and ultimately to working on consumer packaged goods, right? Yep. Yes. And uh, yeah, and that led to my, (laughs) to me realizing that I really love innovating, like really, really love it. And it helped me really to really understand how to use my degree in a way that was both creative as well as functional as far as um, creating products that people really could use. Yeah. So can you tell us about when you first started, you know, well, I guess, I guess kind of getting back to this, maybe we shouldn't lean too much into this dichotomy of you're either creative, you know, you're either left-brained or you're right-brained. But was there were there ever times when you were kind of finding your professional path where you thought, oh, I have to sort of leave that part of myself aside and adopt more of a you know traditional way of thinking um, about science? Or did it did, did you always sort of have a way of 
keeping both the artistic side of yourself and the scientific side of yourself uh, at the forefront when you were kind of coming into your professional identity? Yeah, I, I think initially I did try to keep the two things separate, my love of art and my love of science. So initially when I graduated from college, I actually couldn't find a job. And so I found the job at, instead, I couldn't find a job in my field. I found the job instead in psychology. So as a behavioral counselor, which is maybe surprising. And I really, really enjoyed counseling. It helped me, you know, with that other side of things that I really, really enjoyed and was missing because I had only focused on engineering in college. But then after several years, I was missing the other side again, and I still didn't know how to combine the two things. Um, I went to graduate school and was eventually recruited from graduate school to work at P&G. And that's where I was able to see both sides coming together, the psychology of the consumer coming together with the, um, I guess, with the chemistry of the formulation and with, you know, the need to scale up the products from an engineering perspective. So it wasn't until much later after I graduated from college that I was able to figure out how to combine those two things. So tell me where you first started hearing story and its importance to the innovation process. I think when, um, so after p and I was there for six years, I moved on and I've started working at Cal, which is a Japanese owned uh, consumer product goods company. And I think it was there that I heart started hearing more about story. I was hearing it at, Cal, at P&G, but I was more on the engineering side at P&G and was just, you know, really getting my bearings as far as, you know, how to bring those two sides together. It was at Cal that I really started to understand storytelling and its significance, not only in um, creating and developing new products, but also in getting those products launched um, I was using storytelling as a way of influencing those decisions to launch. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, it was there that I was able to really understand the power of storytelling. And it's not that it wasn't being done at PNG, it's just that I wasn't as exposed to it there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And and for for those listeners who aren't as familiar with Cal, they um it, it is a global consumer packaged goods um and company and you know, you might recognize some of their brands like Biore and Jurgens and John Frieda and cosmetic brands, salon brands and human healthcare brands. So, um, so yeah, tell us a little bit more if you could. Do you remember some of those first exposures to the ways in which story played a role in helping support buy-in for innovative ideas at Cal? Yeah. Yeah. So I think a big thing, and this was at both places. And also, as I think about it, it was even in college or in, um, or graduate school, you know, thinking about having to uh, share your innovation ideas with other people. Storytelling is extremely important in helping people who don't necessarily understand the technology or the innovation. It's important in helping them to really uh, see how innovation can, can come to life and how it can solve problems. So starting with the problem itself, and then showing the relevance of technology and how it can um, solve that challenge. Um, that came, that started really um, at Cal when I started having to go before the leaders of the organization and explain, um, this is the technology and here's why I think we should launch it. Starting with, here's the consumer and here's the experience they're having and the gap that exists and how the technology can fill that gap and then help us with meeting the mission of changing lives for consumers. I love that. That's that's a very helpful formula or sort of strategy to try um, in terms of the way that you structure an argument when you're going to get buy-in. Mm -hmm. And I would love to know, do you have memories of kind of experiencing progress in, in this part of your professional identity, the ability to stand and tell that story in a way that elicited by it more easily. Do you, did you kind of notice progression there? Did you, was it something that was intentional for you that you, you thought I need to work on this? I know this is important. Yeah. I think for me initially it was, why am I not able to influence these decisions that are being <laughs> sure. made? <laughs> and just sure. trying to focus on influence, influence, influence. And, um, 
you know, there are some, tra- there's some training that you can do leadership training and it talks about how to influence others. So, you know, experiencing that training and still not make, being able to find success in influencing decisions. Um, so I had to hit my head against the wall quite, quite a bit. And um, after a while, it started, I, I guess I started seeing the pattern that whenever I laid out my arguments in a certain way, I was more likely to get buy-in. And also noticing that if I told my um, my colleagues or counterparts, hey, lay out your story this way to get buy-in, noticing the difference in their success if they did that versus if they didn't do that. That really, that really helped me with solidifying that, okay, there's something about storytelling um, that will help me to get in, uh, this influence that I need. And also, uh, I guess, just doing that over and over and over and then coming up with that formula for exactly how to do that. Okay, I think this is so important. If you can, let's break down that formula a little bit more. I I know you just (laughs) briefly talked through it, but I think any time we can recognize a pattern within an innovation story that works, Mm -hmm. that's something to pay attention to. I think sometimes storytelling gets a bad rap as something that's just sort of ephemeral. It's just touchy feely, I guess you might yeah. say, you know, like, oh, it's storytelling. People do it around the campfire, you know, not in the boardroom. But when you start to actually listen rhetorically and you're paying attention to the patterns that emerge around the arguments and and that that could be in what's being said and how mm-hmm. it's being said. So Tell us again, I, I know you walked us through the pattern that you found that worked, um, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into it because I think it's so critical mm-hmm. that we start to be able to hear for those patterns. Okay. And I feel like the patterns are on a couple of different levels. There is the consumer level, there's the technology level, and then there's the product level. Great. Um, so this is a pattern that I found when working on upstream innovation. So it's innovation that's maybe three to five years out. First, it's really, really understanding um, what's the theme of the problem or the actual problem that needs to be solved and who exactly has this problem. So for me, it was a consumer, most likely a woman, um, who had this problem. So I would go in and try to figure out what is the story behind the problem that the consumer is experiencing. First of all, um, how do they describe the problem so that I can use the same words when I talk to her. Um, How does the problem look and feel to her? So can I take pictures of the problem? Can I find some way of capturing exactly what she's seeing, whether it's, you know, photos or if it's um, some type of um, measurement that I'm doing on her skin or for her hair? Can I take pictures? Can I capture that both qualitatively and quantitatively, so that then when I go back to the lab and I have to explain this, people really get what I'm saying. So that's the other piece of it. Um, How does what I can measure compare to what she's saying she's experiencing? That's Mm -hmm. the other part of it. Um, Also, understanding the gap that exists. So what's the desired experience versus the experience that they're currently having? And where is that gap? Yes. And I hear, I hear your, your engineering background come out in that as well. You know, the systems engineering (laughs) way of thinking of current state and future state. Um, I love that. Or sometimes in the, in the world of branding, if you're, if you're in that space and you're listening to this podcast, you might think of from and to statements. Uh, That's really prominent in that kind of sector of things. The other part that I want to know about is the motivation. So yes, there's the functional side of things, But I'm also interested in the motivational side, so the psychological side. Um, This is where your behavioral health, your behavioral counseling must have actually played a very formative role. I think so. Um, Yeah, so motivationally, what is it that the consumer is trying to do? Like, where does she want to be or he? Where do they want to be? And how does what they're doing play a role in that? And then what's the gap that's there? So I want to understand the emotional side of things. And then if I'm creating a physical product, I also want to understand from the aesthetic perspective, what are the um, the gaps as far as the desired experience and the actual experience. So it's taking all of those things and then figuring out um, from a technology perspective, what is the role of technology in filling those gaps? 
in a way that leads to a superior product experience. Definitely. And then when you're going to get buy-in, um, especially in an organization that has the consumer at its at its center, you really need to be able to tell that story and express those motivations in a way that tees up the technology solution, right? Yes. Yes. And all of this feeds into the product itself. So now I have this technology, this package of technology that I can add to this product base that delivers on the functional and aesthetic and emotional concerns of the consumer. Now, how do I create that product and give marketing a story around that so that whenever they go and they talk to sales or the consumer or the retailer, they're able to to help them to understand in a very compelling way why this should launch, why this should be on the shelves and why, you know, for the consumer, why they should be purchasing and using this product. Yes, I love how you mentioned, you know, I, th- I think so much of that consumer research dives into empathy and th- how critical it is to innovation, being able to see from the mindset of anyone who you're hoping to serve or benefit by your innovation. And then you're also speaking to alignment. So how do I shift and change the narrative to meet the expectations, especially internally, of people mm-hmm. in different departments? Because what manufacturing needs to know to buy in is very different uh, than what sales needs to know in order to buy in. Exactly. That's true. Absolutely. <laughs> so yes, storytelling, to me, I, I truly believe that um, storytelling and innovation are kind of like the same thing <laughs> because they go hand in hand in getting something launched and innovation launched. So what I also love about your you, Elisa, is that you are passionate about story sharing <laughs> and you started a podcast uh, called The Beehive and it's about women entrepreneurship. You also have your certificate in women's entrepreneurship from Cornell and I'd love to know, you know, what inspired you to start listening and capturing this, the voices of women in entrepreneurship? Um, well, I guess the biggest thing was I, I just wanted to give back. I guess I think that women play a very, very important role in society as far as helping society to advance. And I see many, many cases where women's voices are not heard. They're stifled. And I think that um, for women, being financially empowered um, can help with raising and lifting those voices. And so I was just trying to figure out a way uh, to do that, to help women with understanding uh, how they could create their own businesses and um, share their voice to the world. So the purpose of the podcast was really to break down. Um, the different parts of owning a business to help women to see other women who have started their own businesses, even if they know nothing about a particular product or category. And just, I just wanted to give courage to those women who wanted to go out and do their own thing. So that was one side of me doing my podcast. And then the other side was from a corporate perspective, I was seeing that there were uh, smaller companies that were coming in and starting to take market share. And I was trying to understand what's happening in the startup world such that they're able to come in and to convince retailers to launch products that we can't even launch. We see that there's a consumer need, but for some reason we're not able to launch something that actually fits that consumer need. We see it out there, we can't launch it, but then the startup comes in that has no background in the category and they're able to actually be successful. So I was trying to understand, you know, from a corporate perspective, what is this magic about startups? So there were two sides of that. Oh, fascinating. And so really the, the one of the audiences for the podcast was, was of course, women entrepreneurs or aspiring startup founders, but also another audience were corporate innovation leaders who wanted to really better understand disruption and, and how startups think. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. (laughs) What were some of your favorite interviews and episodes? Hmm. Um, Well, first, I I always felt like whenever I did the episodes that the people that I was interviewing were talking to me (laughs) at points, at some points. Um, So it was a very encouraging thing. One of my favorite episodes was when I talked to Kara Golden, who is the founder of Hint Waters. 
And um, it was just interesting talking to her. I think she was the last episode that I did. And she talked about how she had an idea for making a drink for her family that was um, more healthy than soda. And she talked to people from different corporations about her idea. And they told her all about how, you know, there's so many regulations. There's no way you can do this. You don't even have the background for it. You can't not use preservatives. And she basically defied all expectations <laughs> and she's been very successful so that was really um that was really eye-opening for me as someone inside a corporation because that's one of the things i think that's a barrier you know we have all these rules at least corporations there are lots of rules and guidelines for what should and should not be done um and it's very very difficult to get around those things or to uh influence people to go beyond what they think needs to be done. So that really helped me to understand truly <laughs> how startups how startups think. So that was one of my favorite ones. Um, I also talked to someone. Uh, this is Kim Addis. Uh, she is the founder of Frame of Mind Coaching. Whenever I did my episode with her, I felt different after, like immediately after the episode, I felt really? Yes. <laughs> well, and I noticed that you have a frame of mind methodology. Was that a an article or is that a certificate? It's a certificate for coaching. I believe so much in that methodology. It's really focused on mindset and how what you focus on grows. Wow. And, you know, whenever you're in a corporation, there can be a lot of frustrations because of all the things you can't do. Um, so that really helped me with understanding how to focus on what I could do and what was within my sphere of influence. But yeah, that that episode with Kim was really, really eye-opening. Um, I think I'm a pretty positive person, but it helped me to really um, understand um, how in trying to influence others, the way that I see those people impacts the way I'm able to influence also. So it's not just me... Um, telling the right story to other people. It's also having my own right story about that interaction. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. So in terms of how we internalize our, our perspectives or our, our perceptions rather. Mm -hmm. Because it impacts how you, how you are interacting with other people and they can feel that. So whether or not you're able to influence people, it's going to be, uh, I, I guess, that's based on what you think of those people. So people can feel it if you're, if you don't think positively about them. <laughs> so it's going to make it harder to influence that situation. Could you share maybe what this might look like inside of an innovation team, for example? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, so I have a good example. So if I'm in an innovation team, I'm on a team a team of maybe three to five people. And there's one person who does not believe in what we're doing and they never believe in it. Right. Like there's always a need to kind of force this person to come along, like pull them along, kicking and screaming. Um, if I don't, if I, I guess if I have a negative opinion of what they're saying, I may, I may interact with them differently if they're bringing up their concerns versus saying, okay, let's think about what you're saying. That's valid. Let's figure out how to address that point. Does that make sense? Dismissing yes. versus helping the person to see that, okay, I see you. I hear you. Let's figure out how to, um, how to use what you're saying, how to leverage that to get to a better place overall. And I've actually, I've actually had that um, <laughs> in my past for, you know, trying to launch things that seem impossible to launch. And but then ending up in a place that was much better than where we thought we could go. You know, I, I love that example. I think probably every listener can relate to a moment in their professional or personal life, even mm -hmm. where um, they were wanting to be cooperative and, and coordinate, and there was a person who maybe they didn't see the same way um, or, or who had sort of hesitated to go in the same direction. And so so in terms of a frame of mind methodology, is it mostly about trying to be mindful and pause and think of the world from that person's perspective? It's about having compassion for mm -hmm. what the person may be thinking or feeling. Yeah. And um, not just dismissing, not just seeing the negative parts of what the person is doing, but also just 
also focusing on the positive things that they're bringing to the situation. I feel like that is so hard. I know (laughs) it's when you're, you know, when you're trying to sail a ship in a direction, for instance, right. Mm -hmm. Or move a five person team in a direction. And, and one person seems to be sort of the wind catching the sail and pulling it the other way. How do you balance that? And does it mean that you're open to course correction and going a different path based on that person? Does it mean that you're just making more time or, or, or trying to sort of change other aspects of of the approach? I think it's going beyond the whether or not you see the situation as negative. So all all circumstances are neutral. We put value to them, right? So if someone's bringing up something that you don't want to hear, you're assigning value to that thing. You're making it negative or positive. That's the first thing. Um, The second thing is um, not being so caught up emotionally in the situation that you can't see the other person's side of it. And it's not necessarily that you take, uh, you stop what you're doing or you take a longer time to get to where you need to go. It's that instead of focusing on how things can be done, you help the person to focus on how they could be done. Yes. So, okay, that is a concern that you have. Let's think about a solution for that concern. So it's kind of focusing on what you want, which is the solution, not necessarily the problem. Yes. And it's doing that in, as you said, a compassionate way yeah. where you're not, you know, ignoring or, or expressing anger or judging the person for having their doubts or right. their different perspectives. And, and the hope of course, is that all perspectives help to shape a, a project and make it better. Yes. I think diversity makes um, innovation much, much better. So I want to hear those diverse thoughts and I want them to be productive. So how can I make that productive? And so frame of mind methodology, that's one heuristic we can use to increase diversity within the innovation process. I would love to chat a little bit more with you about the issue of diversity in innovation. What are some of the challenges that you see still prevalent? And what are your thoughts on how the innovation community can respond? Well, I I mentioned women's voices earlier, right? Um, I think that what's also missing at times are the voices for uh, people of color in general. I think that, I think that um, diversity needs to be intentional. So you have to seek out voices that are not like the other voices in the room. And that needs to have some thought put towards it. How do you bring in the voices that people aren't hearing? And then how do you ensure that people are actually listening and that those voices are being captured, and that you have some plans of actions towards what those voices are saying that needs to be done. So it's not just, it's not always, I guess it's not always easy to do that. It's the same as, you know, if you have just one homogenous thought from the same everyone in the room, it's sometimes difficult to go beyond that, because people don't necessarily want to hear beyond that, because everyone's comfortable. Mm -hmm. I think innovation is about being uncomfortable and being comfortable with that. (laughs) (laughs) I love that so much. Yeah. I mean, innovation does not come from being comfortable. And I I feel like that's part of the reason that there are many companies that aren't innovating because they don't want to step outside of their comfort zone. But bringing in that diverse spot is what's needed to step outside of that. Yes. And I think, I think you alluded to this too, but not just bringing in diverse voices as sort of a a show, if you will, a token. token. (laughs) Diversity theater, yeah. Yes, exactly. (laughs) But ensuring that diversity sits within the stakeholder group as well. So yes. that it's not just thanks for your opinion, close the door on your way out. It's 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 multiple. It, it has to be embedded into every aspect of the organization if it's going to actually in, be influential to the way that that organization operates and and what it chooses to innovate against. Yes, the organization has to have some way of making sure that the diverse voices are not dismissed or totally gotten rid of. But it, it can be very difficult, I think. It can, so, even when people are from the same geographical region or there are, there are other ways in which we can become kind of uh, 
influenced by our own bubbles, if you will. Mm-hmm. I am so grateful for this conversation, Elisa. I would love to know if you have other advice for people who are corporate innovators or startup innovators um, as they look to improve their storytelling and communicate their ideas in a more impactful way. Would you would you please leave us with a little more advice? You've you've given so much in this episode. <laughs> so I you. don't mean to put pressure on you, but I know you've got more. <laughs> Well, first, I think the biggest thing is understanding who your consumer or your customer is and just continually seeking to understand that. Um, As far as technology, it can be very, very difficult to convey. And um, I think this is especially true for upstream technology or, you know, technology that's really, really complex. Um, So figure out a way to make your technology very, very relevant to your consumer to your stakeholders, to your customer. Um, Just make it very, very relevant and also very, very easy to understand. The relevance comes from understanding the stakeholders as well as the consumers and customers. Yes. And then the way that you explain the technology, you just have to figure out a way to break it down in a way that they, they get it. I love that advice so much. I think, you know, you definitely have the heart of a science writer, a science storyteller. And (laughs) so I think we'll hopefully uh, be long uh, colleague friends uh, because of that shared uh, passion for this. So I'm so grateful to get to work with you, collaborate with you, and of course, have you um, on this podcast so everyone can uh, hear your perspectives and, and strategies and advice. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you. This was really great. Thanks, Katie. Absolutely. (laughs) You can follow Elisa Smith on LinkedIn and her organization Centrifuge is also on Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, any kind of social media. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.